Okay, so last time we left off talking about how cells pack all of their DNA into tiny little cells. And we talked about prokaryotes a little bit, about supercoiling, and about looping and holding all of that DNA together in the cell. Uh, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about eukaryotes. Uh, most of the genetics we're going to talk about is eukaryotic organisms, organisms with a nucleus, um, usually diploid organisms. So they have much bigger genomes than small bacteria or single-celled. Um, if you took the entire human DNA, so if you just took one of your cells, uh, extracted just the genomic DNA, and just strung it together end-to-end, -end, all of the chromosomes, and stretched it all out so that it wasn't coiled or looped or anything, uh, it would be over six feet tall. That's th all the DNA in one of your cells, six foot tall. Now, thankfully, it's very, very, very thin, right? So we can condense it really small, but the length is enormous. So in order to organize that and get it into not only a very compact state, but a state that we can actually use it, right? I mean, you could take all the DNA and just twist it all up really, really tight, but if I don't have a way to unravel the parts I want, it's not gonna do any good. So we're gonna talk about organization at this, what we call the chromatin level. So chromatin is the DNA and then all of the proteins that are necessary to condense this down really small and to organize it, okay? So here's my illustration. This is out of your textbook, or maybe it's out of the GenBio textbook, I'm not sure. Uh, here is the most fundamental, the, the basic unit uh, of chromatin structure. Okay, so chromatin is DNA plus proteins. So we're not talking about the double helix anymore, we're not talking about twisting, we're just talking about uh, we're going to assume that that's already going on. We're going to talk about winding DNA around proteins. So here is uh, the, the most basic unit of chromatin is called the nucleosome. And it's a group of proteins, and in this illustration it's the purple stuff. There's actually eight proteins packed in there. Eight proteins, and in this it's just, we're showing it as like a little spool, okay? Uh, it's more complex in its structure than that. But for now, it's just a little spool, eight proteins in there, and the blue is the DNA that's wrapped around it, okay? So I get to wrap the DNA around uh, roughly two times. So two wraps around each of the histone, and then there's the DNA coming out, and then it gets wrapped around another histone, and on and on and on. Your entire chromosomes are full of this, okay? This is like the most basic unit. You usually don't get any smaller than this. Very, very small amount of the genome is not associated with proteins. Uh, and usually if it's not associated with proteins, it's very temporarily. It'd be temporarily unassociated with proteins because you're using it for some reason, and then you immediately wrap it back up, okay? So it's almost always in that state. Now, those nucleosomes, right, that, that only wrapped you around twice. We we're kind of have much more complex wrapping than that. So, each of these guys is then going to be wrapped around each other. So here's the histone octamers, got two loops of DNA around, and then each of these is wrapped into what's called a solenoid, okay? A solenoid is going to be six of these nucleosomes, all wrapped around each other, and they're held together by an additional protein called histone H1. All of these proteins so far are histones. The eight proteins in the nucleosome, those are all histones. They've got specific names, we'll talk about those in a minute. Histone H1 is what holds them together into this solenoid, okay? Now we're not done. Each of those solenoids now gets stacked on top of each other like a bunch of coins, okay? So this solenoid is kind of a one-dimensional deal, right? It's kind of a flat disk that's made up of these six nucleosomes. So in this illustration here, each one of these purple blebs is one of these solenoids, okay? So I'm taking these disc-like solenoids and I'm starting to stack them on top of each other like I'd stack a, a big stack of coins. Now that's, n that's more than what's going on here too because that stack of coins is now twisted. I've got a helical shape of those. So you can see that these are stacked up on each other, but that stack is twisting around each other in a big coil, okay? So that's what's going on here. All those are twisted around each other in a coil. And then those coils are coiled around each other as well, right? I've got this coil of, histo or of solenoids, and then those themselves are coiled around each other. So I've got 
wrappings, coil within a coil, coil, within a coil. coil on top of a coil. Yeah, so coiled around here, those are coiled around each other, those are stacked on top of each other, those are coiled, and then the entire thing is coiled. <laughs> <laughs> We're not done yet. Uh, at this point, let me show you what the proteins look like, the nucleosomes, and then we'll talk about the, the next level. Are there questions at this point, though? Yeah, Will. Sorry, just for clarification. So the DNA is wrapped around a nucleosome, so which the, is then part of a bigger structure? Okay. Or? So the DNA is wrapped around a histone octamer, okay. eight histones. That structure with the DNA wrapped around and the eight, that whole unit is called a nucleosome. Okay. So the DNA, is, DNA isn't wrapped around a nucleosome. The DNA wrapped around a histone octamer is called a nucleosome. So the definition includes the DNA there. Yeah. So what's the function of H2A, B, and H3? Those are the proteins that are in the nucleosome. OK. So they don't have any particular function? They do. I'll get to it. Okay. I, that's preempting my next slide. Okay. Yeah. OK. We're in the process of what's called condensing the DNA. When we pack it down really tightly, we're saying condensed DNA. Here is, that's that image that I started out with at the beginning. Uh, these in teal or blue, those are all the, the eight histone proteins that are inside this histone octamer. Okay. And here's the name of them. It's H2A. So there's histone 1. That was the one that was holding them into the solenoid, histone H1. If we look inside into that histone octamer, we have histone 2A. So we had H1. Now we have H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. So there's four unique protein types. And in the octamer, there's two of each. So there's two H2As, there's two H2Bs, and they're all packed in there making this octamer. Okay. Here is that octamer. This is a really this is a crystal structure. So what people actually have done is taken the DNA, they cut the DNA, clipped it here and here, and then got that DNA protein thing to crystallize in solution. So they've perf they, they, they arrange themselves in a repeating pattern, and you can actually make DNA, you can make proteins crystallize. Actually, under the microscope, they look like little quartz crystals, tiny little microscopic crystals. You can shoot those with x-rays, like Rosalind Franklin did with her uh, uh, just naked DNA. You can get naked DNA to crystallize. You can also get these nucleosomes to crystallize. And by shooting x-rays at them, you can determine the actual three-dimensional structure. So what is here is the actual three-dimensional structure of the histone octamer and then the DNA double helix going around it. So that's not an illustration that some cartoonist just drew. That's an actual representation of where every single atom is in this, in this apparatus. Notice these little flailing tails that are coming off here. Each of these eight histones has that little N terminus, uh, the, the uh, the amine terminus of the amino acid flopping out in the wind there. That is for regulation purposes. The cell is going to determine when the DNA gets more packed densely or whether it's stretched out. So the nucleosome here, this is the kind of like the fundamental structural level. We don't usually change this. But what we do to those little tags is going to tell the, the chromatin how densely to be packed. So if I want to package it up and not use it for a while, I tag all those little ends, and that causes the chromosome to, to get more condensed. If I want to open it up, I release the modifications or modify it differently on those ends. The DNA unwinds and it gets looser. Okay. So what are the additional levels? Right. Everything's always at least at that nucleosome level. But if it gets condensed further, if I tag those histones to condense it further, then I stack the solenoids on top of each other. I twist the stacks. I twist the twists of stacks. And then I start doing looping. So now we're more repre uh, uh, representative of the stuff that prokaryotes were doing. Right? They were supercoiling, and that was the end of their condensation at that level. Then they just started looping. 
Here, we pack them into the nucleosomes, into the solenoids, and then we start looping, okay? So, each one of these is the, the coiled coils of nucleosomes, or of, of solenoids, I'm sorry. <laughs> solenoids are coiled, and then those are coiled. That's what you're looking at here. That's what that line is. So, in addition, we're now going to start looping these out and folding them back on themselves at kind of a higher order level, okay? All of these loops have to be held together, so there's even more proteins that are associated with the chromatin to hold those loops together. Now, those loops get looped on each other as well. So you can see these are the, the loopings here. That loop would correspond to that loop. And now we're looping the loops, folding them again. This level of organization takes more additional proteins to hold it to this level. Okay. The DNA itself is not going to want to wind itself like this. You have to impinge these, these loops by proteins. So the proteins are holding them together. Now, then those loops of loops are looped again, and now we're getting to the level of what you can see under the, elect uh, under the light microscope. This is, would actually be what you're seeing here, is loops of loops. Yeah? If we got like a um, enzyme that just undid all those proteins that help those DNAs get a little bit, what would happen to like your cells? Would they just burst? Um, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> or would they, like, would all the protein I, I don't think they would burst because we're still talking it's contained in a nucleus. So I think the nuclear membrane would probably still hold it all together. Uh, it would just be a really unbunched, knotted mess, right? So the cell is actually holding the, the genome in an organization so that it can have proper access to it. So if you totally undid all of this, this is, this is condensation, but it's really organization. So if you lost all that organization, I, I don't think the cell would probably be able to turn on the proteins it needs to. So the cell would probably just senesce, would stop functioning. It might even actually undergo apoptosis. The cell would recognize my genome is way too disordered, and it might, that might induce apoptosis. I'm not exactly sure. That's my guess. But I would, I would wager it would probably senesce or just kill itself. Yeah. Yeah, probably wouldn't randomly transcribe proteins. I mean, that level is also tightly regulated, um, but it would be it would be really hard for it to to express the proteins it wants to. So, yeah. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Here's an actual uh, electron micrograph of this level of organization. Your DNA is not always in this state, though. This is the most condensed form that it would take. And it only does this usually during DNA uh, or during cell division, right? Completely packs all of its chromosomes really, really tightly in order to move them, okay? Most of the time, your DNA is not this tightly packed, okay? So this is like the extreme example, the tightest thing you could possibly get. Now, when we do karyotypes, when we look at chromosomes, we usually try and get the cell in this state because it's the easiest thing for us to look at. Right? The chromosomes actually look distinct from each other because they're packed so tightly. And in this chromosome, you can actually see the two arms. So this right here is the short arm, and then this is the long arm of the chromosome. And then here's an identical copy. So there's actually two chromosomes here being held together in their, in their little middle region there. So when we look at chromosomes under the microscope, this is usually what we're trying to get the state. And this week in lab, we're going to be looking at cricket chromosomes. And we're going to actually inject them with colchicine. It's a drug that basically stalls them in cell division. So they're going to condense their chromosomes, and then they're not going to be able to divide. So then we'll burst open the cells and take a look at these, kind of like freezing uh, the spermatogonia right in the middle of cell division. So then here's a little karyotype. This is a human karyotype. And so you can see two distinct chromosomes, chromosome number one. The longest chromosome in an organism is almost always called chromosome 1, and they're ordered by length. So chromosome 2 would be the next longest chromosome, 3, 4. So they're getting smaller as you get down. Here is uh, 22. It's the smallest chromosome except for the Y. The Y is even smaller than that. So when we're looking at a karyotype, we're looking at those condensed chromosomes, and these guys have been stained. And so you can see these little banding patterns that are happening there. It bands because of all these proteins that are holding it together. The DNA is actually not carrying the dye here. 
It's the proteins that are holding it that carries the dye. So each of the chromosomes is actually kind of condensed in a slightly different manner. And so you get these distinct banding patterns depending on the density of the proteins that are holding it. So you can identify the chromosomes by length and then also by banding pattern. Kind of each chromosome has a characteristic way that it compacts down and that shows up in the staining as these bands. All right, so this is the most condensed. Most of the time in cells, and we're looking at a nucleus here, the DNA is kind of condensed in some regions, but kind of unraveled in other regions. And that's because we're wanting to have access to the DNA to make proteins off of it. So when you're going to growing cell division, that cell is not interested in making RNAs and making proteins. We're just talking about trying to move the chromosomes. In an active cell that's ongoing, you're going to have a much, I don't know, uh, much less homogeneous uh, condensation of the DNA in the nucleus. Okay. This is called heterochromatin. This is the really dark stuff. So this is the nucleus. The nuclear membrane is here. Oh, actually, no, it's not. Maybe that's that right there. But this is all DNA in here. Everything darkly stained is DNA. The heterochromatin is stuff that basically the cell has said that's not important for whatever I'm doing right now. And so it's condensed it down very, very tightly. Now, can you see individual chromosomes here now? No because some of the chromosomes are unraveled and some of that chromosome is condensed. And then an adjacent, you know, chromosome number two, part of it is unraveled and part of it is condensed. And so it's all within the nucleus. There's nothing separating the chromosomes from each other. So to our eye, and in this, it looks kind of a big disorganized mess, right? I got some regions that are condensed and that could be several chromosomes that are actually condensed near each other. And then I've got unraveled stuff and that could be several unraveled chromosomes that are uh, that are next to each other. So you can't really tell where the chromosomes are at this point. So the dark stuff is heterochromatin. That stuff that's shut off, we're not doing any transcription on it. The other stuff is called euchromatin. So here is euchromatin. Here's a little bit of hetero, here's euchromatin. This is roughly at the beads on the string, the nucleosome level of organization. Now, some of it, you can see some of it is more concentrated than that, or more condensed than that. So it's kind of varying levels of condensation, but it's definitely not really dense like the, like the heterochromatin. This is the stuff that's actually going to be used by the cell. That's the DNA level where the proteins are coded that's necessary for this cell doing whatever its function is. So the organization of the genome changes. Organization of the chromosomes change depending on what kind of cell type we're talking about. So in one cell, we could take a picture of it and it's, it would be organized in such a way. If I took a picture of a different uh, nucleus of a different cell type, it's going to have different regions condensed and non-condensed. There's actually growing evidence too that this is not just random unfurling, just so that we have access, but actually the arrangement of chromosomes next to each other is a really important thing. So we're only starting to scratch the surface of this, but the organization, the, like the architecture of how the chromosomes are lining up with each other uh, seems to be a really important thing in terms of determining cells function. It's hard to get a hold on this though, because this is a really dynamic process. I'm showing these static pictures and everything's just staying the same here. But in a living cell, these chromosomes are moving around, proteins are, are associating certain chromosomes next to each other, and then they lose it for a while and come back together. It's a really dynamic thing that's going on. And that's hard to image, right? How do you get a time-lapse movie of chromosomes uh, moving around? Uh, that's really hard. I mean, to get these type of images, this is a frozen sample that's undergone um, you know, transmission electron microscope. Uh, so we've taken a sample, we've frozen it, you've like sputter coated it with gold if you guys have done this in cell biology yet. That's a really fixed sample, it's not doing anything. So we're only now getting like the microscopy ability to actually try and see these things moving in real time or even approaching real time. So this is a, a whole new area of genetics too. Like what is the chromosomal's organization, or the, the nucleus's organization of the chromosomes? All right, questions at this point. 
I'm moving really fast because I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> so, got the difference between euchromatin and hetero? So she says, is it true that heterochromatin the cell doesn't use? Um, heterochromatin, and again, this is a dynamic issue. Uh, when is it heterochromatin and when is it not? It's probably changing in the course of the cell's lifespan, right? So whenever we took this picture, that probably wasn't making any proteins off of it. But if I would have kept that cell in culture later or at a different developmental stage or a different environmental situation, different age of the cell's life, that might not be heterochromatin anymore and it might be opened up. So the cell always has access to its DNA, but at this current moment, probably nothing is happening there. But if the cell needs that, it can modify the histones, it can unravel it and, and work off of it. So this is called the inaccessibility hypothesis, that it's inaccessible so it's not using it. Uh, but you can always, the cell can always unravel it if it needs to. This gets into like cell differentiation. Um, at one point, embryos don't have distinct skin tissue versus nervous tissue. At that point in development, it's just a general type of uh, cell type called the ectoderm. And the cells have to make a decision about whether they're going to become skin or whether they're going to become neural, neurons. Um, the hypothesis is, well, when you become skin, you commit yourself to this line and you shut off everything that would possibly allow you to become a neural cell. So you would condense all of that DNA, package it down, and this is a type of cell differentiation, right? If a cell has packed away all the stuff to become a neuron, then it's probably not going to become a neuron. And for the most, most part, you don't have skin cells spontaneously becoming neurons in your body right now. That's called terminally differentiated. That cell has decided it's going to become skin, and it's terminally differentiated. Um, there are other cell types that are a little bit more flexible. So when we're talking about stem cells or things like that, they don't condense their chromosome as tightly or as permanently. So they're a little bit more capable of changing cell type. Now, we can artificially force cells to unravel all of their DNA and we can force a skin cell to go back to a completely generic cell type. Um, in mice, you have actually, we've actually taken, by we, I mean the scientific community, because I don't <laughs> condone this at all, but it's possible to take a skin cell, force the expression of certain genes that unravel all of the heterochromatin. And that basically puts the cell in a generic state, and then the cell asks, what cell type am I? I don't know, and it looks for cues in which to decide what should I become. And we can force the expression of other proteins and make skin cells become any type of cell we want. In mice, you can actually take a skin cell. You can, uh, this is called um, induced pluripotent cells, or IPS cells. Uh, you can actually force that to become generic, put it in an environment, and it will think it's a fertilized egg. No way. A single egg, that skin cell thinks it's a single egg that's been fertilized and will start becoming an embryo. And you can actually get live, fertile mice out of that by getting that skin cell to grow to a certain embryologic, embryological sta stage, implant it into the womb of a pregnant, uh, you know, a, a faux pregnant mouse. You trick the mouse into thinking she's pregnant. You implant this induced pluripotent cell, and it will become a completely live, viable, fertile clone. Now, there's no reason to think you can't do this with human cells because we've, t we've done everything up to actually implanting it into a woman's womb. Uh, as far as I know, no one's done that. Um, maybe people are doing that and not publishing the work, but you can do the exact same reprogramming with any cell in the human body. So, so they're making clones now. Yes, you can make, well, we've always been able to make clones. We've just done it by taking an egg, removing the DNA out of it, and sticking DNA from another cell in there. But we've taken it one step further. We don't even need an egg anymore. You can just reprogram a skin cell to think it's an egg and get an entire organism to grow up from that. This is, this is pretty crazy. <laughs> why don't I condone it? Um, because, uh, because my worldview says that life begins at, um, well, I was going to say conception, but there's no conceiving here. If by conception you mean 
uh, egg and sperm coming together. But I think that that induced pluripotent cell is a unique individual. And so I don't think we should be making unique individuals. Um, uh, I, I guess I might be able to be persuaded that for reproductive purposes, if this is all you can do, maybe that's OK. I don't think that's probably the right way to be reproducing. Um, so most of these cells are used then for creating stem cell lines. And so I don't condone the use of killing any type of organism for the sake of harvesting its cells. And so I, you know, my worldview says that, that whether it was induced pluripotent, uh, an induced pluripotent cell or egg and sperm coming together, uh, that's a unique embryo that's developing. To, and so I'm, I'm not going to kill that, or do anything to that. So yeah, I think there's better ways to reproduce than that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so, uh, let's go with Will, because he's got his um, hand up for a minute. So my question uh, is, if that's, uh, what do we need, what do we need uh, embryonic stem cells for if we can just use what you just said? Yeah. And I'm thinking not necessarily making life, but I'm thinking things they want to use stem cell research for, which is making yeah. parts or organs or things that they need. That's why people make these kind of cells, is to get around the use of embryos, and so what's or the problem? use of eggs. And But in my worldview, the two are equivalent, right? Um, and let me give you an example, and then you can follow up with me for a minute. Um, if you have a single fertilized egg, it divides to the two cell stage, and those two cells are physically separated from each other, you get identical twins, right? So is that identical twin not a human, not worthy of rights, just because it didn't come out because of an initial conception of egg and sperm coming together? I think that those identical twins are two unique individuals who deserve all rights and right to life. So just because you took a skin cell and reprogrammed it to think it's an embryo, I still think that that's an individual who has rights. So I don't think that gets around the embryo issue, though most people that advocate for this say, well, we didn't use any sperm and we didn't use any eggs, so therefore it's not an embryo and we can do with it whatever we want. And my view of life is, is broader than that. So that's why I don't say I think life begins at conception. Uh, I think there's other ways <laughs> that life can begin. So do you want to feed back now? Is that? Well, I, I didn't actually even want to broach that issue because I lose <laughs> the rest of our class time. That is perfectly fine. We're, uh, we'll learn a lot right here. Uh, we'll the, make it up someplace else. My question was more about like um, if we needed to make um, a kidney, let's say, mm -hmm. um, they could take an, a, a stem cell, or a, not a stem cell, but one of these IP, IP IPS cells, cells, yeah. IPS cells. And they could reprogram it to be a kidney cell, and then it would just grow a kidney. What, where, yeah. where, you, where was the problem there with that? Because that's not well, making a human. So if you do that, if you reprogram cells, they think they're embryos, and there's no way around that. OK. Oh, OK. I so I would be happy to take some other cell type and not make them induced pluripotent. So induced pluripotent, by definition, means I fooled it into thinking it's an embryo. So I'm, I'm for stem cell research, and I think there's possibilities where we could take a skin cell and directly reprogram it into a kidney cell and skip that whole embryo stage. So what you're saying is they can actually make the, whatever the animal is, and then they just take out the kidney? Is that what you're saying? Like it's a fully grown? Well, it's not fully grown. Or, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say. I mean, I'm yeah. saying it makes everything, and you're just choosing which parts to take from it? Is that what you're saying? It well, doesn't just make the one thing you need? Right. If, if, okay. you, if you reprogram a cell into an induced pluripotent state, that means I've made that cell think it's an embryo, and it starts making all cell types and developing like an embryo does. There's other types of reprogramming the nucleus, the reprogramming of the cells that we could do that wouldn't cause it to think it's all cell types. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about that. Uh, I still have some reservations about whether we should be doing that. Um, but it's not for embryo reasons. It's, you know, we could go into that later, maybe into that when we do. Uh, I, I teach all about this for a semester long in the um, advanced biology seminar. And we do stem cells every spring. We talk about induced pluripotent cells, stem cell ethics, um, all of this. But I just want you to know right now, <laughs> you can actually reprogram what's going on in the, in the nucleus. And that makes huge effects for what that cell thinks it is. So yeah. So if, you, so if we did the IPS, uh -huh. And we're just making an identical, identical twin of ourselves. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right? 
If you, if you do IPS with your own skin cell, you are making an identical twin genetically to yourself, and that thinks it's an embryo. Yeah. And unless it gets planted into a womb, it's not going to survive. So, yeah. So Sarah. I'm just emphasizing when you, so you're having a problem with the pluripotent embryo cell or whatever? Yes. Because it has a possibility for life? No, I, I wouldn't say it has a possibility for life. I think it's alive, and I think it's developing like an, an embryo. Well, I mean like so. individual life is what I'm saying. Like, I guess like it does have, like it is Yeah, alive. yeah, I think it's a unique individual that's living. Which is why it's okay to like take a skin cell and directly redirect it to a kidney cell. Yeah, I don't, not. yeah, and I don't have problems with cell culture. Like I can take skin cells and keep them alive and growing in a Petri dish, and I'm not opposed to that, because those don't think they're embryos, and I don't think any unique individual is there. But. If it acts like an embryo, ontologically, all of that, what is it? I don't know, but it's acting like an embryo, and I'm going to err on the side of life and not, and not, uh, not kill it. Yeah. All right. Well, we can talk about this more. I've got cloning and an IPS cell lecture later, and we'll talk some about the nitty gritty of how you actually do reprogram it. Um, but that was fun. <laughs> Okay, we're going to shift a little bit, and so I've talked about the level of condensation, how tightly packed the chromosome is. I now want to start talking about chromosomal structure, because not all regions of the chromosome are, are equal. In terms of sequence, they're very different, and then also in terms of actually how they're condensed and their structure is different. So I want to step back and take a look at this chromosome in its fully condensed form. And we talked about this being two individual chromosomes, so they're two linear pieces of DNA. Now, they're tightly packed around each other, but I've got one strand of DNA that's, you know, very, very long, very, very densely packed, but it's still a unique individual strand. And then I have a second individual strand here, and they're being held together in this region called the centromere. So the centromere is roughly in the center of chromosomes, though sometimes it's not in the center at all, so it's kind of a misnomer sometimes. But generally, the centromere is the region of the chromosome in the center. It, in terms of its sequence, it's very different from the rest of the chromosome in that it's highly repetitive. So the sequence of base pairs is very repetitive, same repeats over and over. These are called tandem repeats. They're usually like short stretches of sequence. It would be like, you know, 10 to 20 nucleotides long. And then that same sequence of 10 to nucleotides gets repeated right next to it, and then repeated right next to it. And this can go on dozens of times. So you could have, you know, a couple of short tandem repeats, you know, that, where that piece gets repeated maybe three or four times, or you could have a dozen or more repeats, okay? So very repetitive usually means it's not making any proteins in there. There's also, there's other repetitive regions of the chromosome called satellite DNA. Uh, we'll talk about that as well, but there are some satellite um, sequences in here as well. I just, for now, I just want you to know it's highly repetitive. And then there's a whole group of proteins that specifically bind to those tandem repeat sequences, okay? So this is where the primary structure, the sequence of the DNA is actually kind of characterizing how the, the structure of it is going to be, what kind of proteins associate with it, and how densely packed it is and stuff, okay? So these SEN proteins bind to this centromeric region, and they condense it down really tight, makes it look like a very narrow little tiny waist to the chromosome, okay? So it's very pinched in there. It's because it's being held together very, very tightly with these centromeric proteins. And these centromeric proteins are involved in holding the sister chromatids together. So these are two identical chromosomes called sister chromatids. And so the centromere is what's holding those two together. The other are remaining distinct from each other. These are only held together by the centromere. And they also attach to the spindle, the kinetochore. And so they associate with the spindle, and this is what allows you to move the two chromosomes to the two sides of the cell when you're undergoing division. This is unique to eukaryotes. Prokaryotes don't do anything like this. No centromeric regions.
This is just to overwhelm you. Don't write all this down. But I just want you to see the, the huge number of proteins that are just centromeric proteins. So CENPHIKL, CENPAMQ50. There's all kinds of these centromeric proteins, and we keep discovering more of them. So these are proteins that are specifically just holding that chromosome together at that level. These change, too, depending on you know, what stage the chromosome is at and how far it's condensed. But these are the proteins that are holding them together. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah, there's, so tandem repeat is just a generic term for how the repeats are set up. They're short sequences that get repeated tandemly. So it's not just like AT, 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 right? That would be repetitive, but that's not a tandem repeat. A tandem repeat is a short sequence that gets repeated over and over again. It's like saying the same word over again, right? If I just kept saying tandem, 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 that's repetitive. If I say AT, 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 that's repetitive, but it's at the nucleotide level. So tandem repeats are kind of like at the word level, bigger sequence. And there are, tandem repeats are all over the place. And there's different tandem repeats on different chromosomes and do different things. But in general, centromeric regions have lots of them. Okay. We won't talk about which kinds just yet. And you said that those tandem repeats determine what kind of protein? The tandem repeats determine what kind of protein binds to them. Yeah, that's true. Certain proteins tend to bind to certain types of tandem repeats. So. Centromeric proteins recognize the tandem repeats that are in centromeres. So. OK, so that's centromeric regions. The other distinct thing on chromosomes is the telomeric regions. So centromeres are kind of in the middle. Telomeres are always right at the ends of the chromosomes. So this is a little illustration that's showing you the telomeric regions. So. Each linear chromosome is going to have two telomeres, one on the short end. So here's the centromere in the middle, kind of in the middle. There'll be a telomere on the short arm. The short arm is always called the P arm. Think of it as the petite arm. And then if you mind your P's and Q's, the opposite of P is Q. So the big arm is the Q arm. And so I'll have a centromeric region at the end of that one. And then in the sister chromatid, I'm going to have two telomeres, P and Q arms as well. This is also re highly repetitive. And it's got specific tandem repeats, too. I actually put up the telomeric repeat here. So in mammals, the telomeres almost always have tandem repeats of TTA, GGG. And that just gets repeated over and over and over again. Um, DNA is, is often susceptible to getting degraded and broken, so the ends of chromosomes are very fragile. So the, no, the first thing that telomeric repeats do is actually kind of s stabilize the ends. Uh, free 5 prime and 3 primes are often get digested away or broken away. So what the telomere does is it actually induces and makes the chromosome look like it's circular. Okay. Chromosomes in in eukaryotes, almost always linear, so they've got these ends. But the two ends are going to kind of loop back on themselves and kind of mimic being circular. And this is we're capable of doing this because the DNA is repetitive. Got lots of repeats on it. And so you can actually loop one end back. And well, we'll just talk through the figures. So, OK, here's. 5 prime and 3 prime, and I'm not showing you, but this is the, the chromosome would be going off in the left-hand direction, right? The, the bulk of the chromosome would be over here. Here is the telomere. 5 prime and 3 prime are base pairing in traditional double helical fashion here, twisting around each other. And then right here, I start getting an aberration. Those two complementary strands are pulled apart from each other, and I've got some open region here. This is called the D loop. So the dark blue and the light blue are separated from each other. This all gets coated by protein. DNA hates to be naked. It's, all, it's either going to be um, complementary base pairing with another piece of DNA, 
or it's going to be coated by proteins to keep those bases from being exposed. So this D loop has got a bunch of proteins, don't worry about their names, uh, that's holding that single strand in there. Okay, then the thing comes back together and the repeats, the repetitive region is base pairing together again, okay? This loops around, and here, these are all telomeric repeat proteins. So just like the centromeric region had specific sen proteins that associate with it, so the telomeric regions have telomere proteins that stick to it, okay? So there's lots of them, TRF1, 2, and there's all these associated ones. We get all the way back over here and see now it's looping back on itself. This is called the T loop. So the D loop is the small little double strands being pulled apart. Uh, the T loop is actually the double stranded looping back on itself. And when I get all the way here to the end of the chromosome, the five prime end stops, okay? But then I have a long sequence that's just single stranded three prime. And that comes in, and since this is repetitive DNA, it's the same sequence. So it can base pair up with a previous portion of the chromosome. So that three prime here in the dark blue is going to come back and it's going to base pair with the other strand of the D loop. And so I've kind of mimicked, I've made a pseudo circular genome here at the end. That's going to keep it from getting degraded, makes it more stable. It provides an interesting problem though, because I don't have double stranded DNA here on that three prime tailing end. This is difficult because when I'm going to replicate this, when I make a new copy, I don't have any template strand on one side. So the cell doesn't know how to repeat that. So what's going to happen is every time the cell replicates its genome, that telomeric end is going to shrink by a little bit. Because I don't know what the sequence is. There, there isn't a mechanism for telling me how to make a new end for this three prime, because uh, there's nothing there. Now, we'll go into replication in just a minute and next time, and we'll talk about why this really is a problem, but right now I want you to think, every time a cell divides, that telomere gets a little bit shorter, and it unravels the T loops and the D loops and reforms, but it's a little bit shorter than it was the last time. And if the cell replicates again, it's a little bit shorter than the last time. This is happening in most of your somatic cells, the cells that make up the bulk of your body, and the cells actually use this as a timing device. The cell knows how old it is because of how long the telomeric ends are. So the shorter it gets, the cell knows I'm an older and older cell. This will actually be a negative feedback loop, and at a certain point, when the telomeres get so short, the cell will decide, I have lived long enough, I've probably div divided so many times, and I've probably accumulated some mutations, that it's probably best that I don't survive anymore. So cells will stop dividing at this point and won't replace themselves. It doesn't, it doesn't induce apoptosis. They're not going to kill themselves off. But if a cell is very, very old and has very short telomeres, it just stops. Because what the risk is now is if you keep getting shorter and shorter, you might run out of that repetitive region, and you might start actually removing protein coding regions. The other is you might have accumulated, accumulated a lot of mutations, so old cells tend to not, not go anymore. If you just took a primary skin culture and took some skin cells and started growing it in a Petri dish, you could only uh, get those to divide a certain number of times, and after a while they would just stop. They'd stay alive in your dish, but they'd no longer keep dividing. So most of your cells know how old they are. This is part of the aging process. Uh, your skin cells, quit making collagen and stop dividing, and so your skin gets thinner, less collagen, more susceptible to damage, harder to heal itself. Uh, this is going on all over your body, okay? Was there a question? Yeah. I wanted to know what you specifically wanted us to know for the D-loop and T-loop ideas. Uh, I want you to be able to kind of sketch this structure. Okay. So you should know what the T-loop and the D-loop are made up of. I don't, you don't need to know all of the telomeric protein names, but you should know that this is single-stranded, you know, coded by proteins, double-stranded loop is the T loop, and then at the end, you know, the three prime comes in and base pairs with the previous section. So. Is this figure in our book? Uh, I don't think it is. It's out of Nature Reviews Genetics. 
or Nature Reviews Cancer, actually. Doesn't that have application for longevity studies? Yeah. So what if you added telomeric um, tendon repeats? Then would that yeah. extend the length of the cell? It would, yeah, so if you were able to add more telomeres on the end of the cell, it should theoretically extend the life of the cell. Now, there are certain cells that actually turn on an enzyme called, oh, what's the name of it? Uh, reverse transcriptase. Uh, that actually extends the telomeric re regions. So certain cells in your body do extend this, and so there are certain cells that can continue to divide over and over perpetually. Um, stem cells, germline cells, cells that are making eggs and sperm. Uh, they don't divide many times, and when they do, they keep extending their telomeric regions. Would that increase the risk for mutations in cancer? It does. It increases the risk of mutations in cancer, because the longer a, a cell has been around, the more time it's had to accumulate mutations. Yeah. So it also has implications for, um, um, for cancer. You wouldn't have a problem with cancer if a cell just started dividing uncontrollably, because if it reached a certain level where the telomeric ends were too short, then your tumor would stop growing and you wouldn't have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. The problem, and so sometimes that happens. There are benign tumors. You get growths of certain cell types and they grow, but they don't turn on anything to lengthen their telomeres. So they just grow to a certain point. At that point, they just stop growing and you might have a lump, but it, if it doesn't get big enough, it wouldn't be a problem. The problem in cancer is when it turns on the genes to extend its telomeres. Now you have a cancer that will continue to grow forever. And that's when it's going to become a real problem, right? How is, is there somebody that tells it to do that? Why does it do that? Is there a reason like, to do that too much? Um, no, I, I mean, I love teleological questions. I think the cell, you know, does dictate its own genome at a, at a certain level, and that cells do things. Um, so I mean, we can come up with a lot of reasons why and why it's advantageous, but um, I think you're programmed to uh, your cells actually are, are trying not to induce cancers, trying not to perpetuate mutations, and so turn themselves off. Um, there's questions about how long are we designed to live. Maybe that's where you're going. Um, I think... It seems like that's a, that's a good thing for the body as, as a whole. So, I mean, you know, let's produce something that will overrun our body and kill us. It doesn't seem like an advantageous yeah. idea. No, it's not. But this is why I mean it, it brings up interesting questions about how long we're meant to live. If, we're, if our bodies were meant to live forever, then we shouldn't, we should keep extending our telomeres so that our cells keep reproducing, right? So are we designed to live a finite time? And is this the thing that's been designed to keep us from living forever? Or is this a result of the fall that we were originally designed to live forever, but now we don't extend our telomeres. We are subject to mutations. and in a sense, it might be a means of common grace, right, so that we don't live forever. There's all kinds of theology here. <laughs> Rachel. Yeah, um, yeah, most of the research is trying to identify cells that are cancerous, and one of the ways is to, if they're turning on the genes that extend the telomeres. That's one way to try and identify and differentiate a cancer cell between a non-cancer cell, right? So there's certain chemotherapies that, and certain treatments for cancer that try and target, let's just kill off the cells that are just ha have that telomeric thing on. The problem is you start killing bone marrow cells and you start killing eggs and sperm. I mean, it's all the typical problems that you have with chemotherapies, right? So actually there's more research on trying to decide uh, uh, at a more specific type, right? Rather than just kill anything that's got telomeric extending, let's try and actually identify what kind of cancer this is, what are the unique genes that it turns on, and try and kill off just those cells, so. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.